blesses us. Hey, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. I'm back again. I had a small emergency there, technical emergency. But I'm, I'm going to get straight to the Word of God. I was telling you before that this, this coming Saturday, uh, my friend Susie has got one of the largest events, One Day 2020. And that event uh, is going to coincide with uh, so many other events out of one many all over the world in over 90 countries and then 50 states a lot of people are going to come in great salvation they're going to take place uh, in it it's a, even right in the midst of pandemic kindness is being poured out to god's people i'm excited that i'm part of what god's doing through this and therefore today i'd like to invite all of you guys in in my city dallas fort worth to come out and uh, the volunteers and everything is going to be at the Allen Convention Center. So you're very much welcome to be part of what God's uh, doing to bring compassion and kindness and the love of God being expressed to, to the needy. And uh, if you, I've been part of Susie's event for the last nine years and I've, I've, I've never seen such great amount of kindness and love and care that's being poured out to these uh, men and women. Uh, the veterans are served, um, children are served, uh, there's foot washing and uh, a whole lot of stuff. I'm part of it because it's connected also to Uganda, Sudan, and Congo, three nations that, um, that, that this event is going to take place. And so we're thankful to what God um, 
God's doing to express and open this alabaster box of love and kindness to, you know, God's people. I, I've been sharing for the last almost coming to two weeks now, if not maybe ten, um, the the overflow of God's love, what this day Christmas, you know, Christmas means for so many of us. Uh, it's causing many people to go out, buy stuff and gifts and everything. And just this today, uh, you know, my sister came over, you know, at my house and she bought gifts for my son. And, and I mean, it's amazing. And that tells you the expression of love has already been poured out. We cannot resist it. We can't stop it. We, we continue through that, you know, and I've, I've shared with you about uh, Jonathan and, um, and Devin, their connection and their love. What is, what's love got to do with it? Everything, you know, it's powerful. It's very sensitive. It can affect you. It can inflict you. It can do great and mighty things. It's very powerful. Don't mess with love. How are you? This Abias, Abias, oh my God, you're gonna kill me for not mentioning your name uh, so well. Hopefully I, I'm, I'm making um, an endeavor to mention your name so well. Blessings to you. But I can see the last name is Natukunda. All right, that's a good name right there. You know, so so then I, and, and then I came in with um, um, uh, just the other day, when love raised a dead man, and the dead man is a friend of Jesus, his name is Lazarus, and we use that as a backdrop to express this bond, the unbreakable bond that happens between somebody who loves you unconditionally. You know, somebody who opens his heart out to you to love you unconditionally. Is that even possible? Can can that happen in a, in a, in a, in this culture? The the culture wars that are taking place, and you know, it it can happen if we do it God's way. If we do it man's way, guess what? It cannot uh, be effective and effective. But I'm here to continue on that because I know where wherever there's unconditional love. The Bible told us, you know, a few days back, it back that. You know, love is greater than any kind of gift. It doesn't matter how great I preach, how great I sing, how great I prophesy, whatever I do with all my giftings without love, I am nothing, totally nothing, okay? It does, they, when you see somebody hiding into their giftings and yet they hate people, they are against people and everything like that, you begin to rethink because love conquers all and wins all. And you know, you can say, no, Michael, because I've been disappointed by so-and-so. Yes, that was man. But when God says love conquers all, love is powerful, you know, it can affect the entire planet. God's speaking according to him because man doesn't know how to affect or to be effective with this gift. Doesn't know, doesn't know. But God does. And so when God says, love conquers all, wins all, it's greater than any man's gift. You know? Greater. Because why? Jesus expressed that great love I'm talking about at the tree, at the cross. And that was when we were even more sinners. We had already sinned. Don't tell me about your salvation right now. Let's talk about before. Okay? Let's talk about before. So, before you ever change, before you ever say I love you Lord, before you ever pray, before you ever come to church, you know, Jesus came and died for you. So if you express, if love won at the tree, love can win now. And if you don't see it that way, you will still be disappointed about those who came and left. You will still never forget and never forgive and you'll still be bitter because you're holding on to what I'm, a mere man, man of flesh, who is imperfect, not like a perfect God, a perfect Christ. But when you see it God's way, saints, it heals you, it changes you, it transforms you, it makes you a brand new person. That even those who try to break you and break your will, 
will look at you and say, we thought we did something to her. We thought we'd try to break her. We thought we'd try to be abusive and, and try to, you know, bubbly and everything and break her self-esteem and everything like that. Oh, he's a self-esteem. And you're still standing. Why? Because you are drinking from the tree of life, not from the tree of man. And that's what's important. When you're drinking from the tree of life, it doesn't matter who try to do what. You know, you are waking up. Like Lazarus, you know, you're waking up from pain, from fear, from despair, from stress, from the past, from everything. You wake up out of that because your cup is running over with this newfound love of your lover. Your lover Jesus came to you when you couldn't get to go to him. And he forced his way to you so he can have you, so you can bond. And obviously it came with a cost. It's come with a cost. It has come with a cost, that, hasn't it? Hasn't your salvation and your walk with God cost you something? It's cost you friends. And some of them were Christians. Some of them were in the house of God. You know, the, right in the house of God, you probably have faced more animosity and more devastating disappointments about people than you would when you're in the world. Do you agree? Because it's it's when you're more vulnerable. When you're around people like Christians, it's when you're more vulnerable. You feel like everybody's going to treat you right. Everybody's going to say, I, I'm sorry, I did this wrong. You, you feel like everybody's just going to just act nice and be okay. And they don't act nice. Because we try to make this, this salvation thing more about love and unity and everything. So we get to know each other's businesses. And it's a center for gossip. And gossip hurts Christians more. This one's talking about you. This, this one is saying about this. And we come to church and, and we raise up our hands and we praise God and and, uh, and we try to, you know, be all about God. But then underneath there, we are individually, totally separate in our behavior and character and everything. That's why it's easy for Christians to be angry at each other and be bitter for each other, never to see eye to eye again. Because sometimes... When people come into the house of God, they let their God down. You know, I don't know who I was talking to, but I was talking to somebody, and 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 uh, I kind of try to mess, you know, mention to them. I said, you know what? I think I'm never afraid about meeting people and what they're going to think. I'm not. You know, why? Because there has to be such a level of trust in who you are. I've said that before. You have to have. A great level of trust in you, who you are and who you are. What does that mean, Michael? It does mean that you have a you have a self will, strength, and power. That nothing will break this relationship, this bond. Like Paul says, nothing will separate us from the love of God. Okay. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. He's, when he says nothing will separate us from the love of God, he's talking about, you know, talk about haters. Paul had a lot of haters. Okay? Paul had his own brothers, his own group of apostles who should have been with him, excommunicate him. Amen? How are you doing, Jen? Blessings, Jen. Blessings, Joan. Blessings, Joel. Blessings to everybody who's watching. Amen? Paul has just come out of Arabia from a study and comes back and he thinks everything's going to be all right in Jerusalem and everybody's going to just embrace him and say, hallelujah, Paul has been converted. Guess what? They kick him out. Did they walk with Jesus? Yes, they walked with Jesus. They walked with Jesus. But when they saw him, they could not reconcile. Okay? They could not reconcile themselves. Okay? with Paul. They said, oh, this is the guy that beat us up. This is the guy that, you know, uh, this is the guy that persecuted us. They didn't know how to forgive him. And right there, Paul finds Barnabas and Barnabas and probably Luke, those two embrace him and they defended him. Look at there. When, when, when the disciples and the Christians in Jerusalem 
could not reconcile with Paul because they, they could not believe that the guy that beat them up and put them in jail, okay, he's now born again, he's now transformed, he's now redeemed. They could not. They couldn't. They couldn't at all. Isn't that, isn't that how people treat you? I mean, they treat you like that. Don't they treat you like that? Some of them believe you haven't changed at all. You know? Some of them believe that, oh yeah, you know, whatever. Because they're not sure that the love of God they think they have on their side has been poured out to you. Look at that. That's, that's not a battle that's out in the world. That's a battle that's in the house of God. It's in the house of God. But even in that, you cannot try to form. You cannot try to feel small. You cannot shrink in it. And most excitingly, it's because Christ has already saved you. He came to you. He came for you. So people don't, don't allow people to make you feel shrink and make you feel small. Because of because they are they are rethinking your redemptive plan or the redemptive plan of God for your life. You are loved of God. I'm still talking about love, saints. I'm still going about around it, you know. And the Paul, let me say, let, let me say this to you: the Paul they did not want to associate with became the greatest of them all. He actually tells them. Me, who was the least among you guys, I became the greatest of them that I might win them all. Look at that. Look at that. And he was still humble. But the point I was trying to make about that, he said, there's nothing that will separate me from the love of God. He says, hunger will never separate, separate me from the love of God. He said, nakedness, not having enough, you know, insufficiency will not separate me from the love of God. They beat him up. Okay, they put him in jail. He said, whatever they try to do, the kind of bond I have with my Savior is inseparable. It's inseparable. Do we need to see a body of believers in our day who are staunchly and powerfully set apart to love God no matter what challenges them? I have been seeing Christians who like to conform. Conformity. Conformity is a danger of your walk with God. You're conforming to the world system. Are you conforming to Babylon? What do you want with Babylon? Because it's got better people who speak. It's got better politicians and everybody. What is it with Christians trying to conform with Babylon and being bad with Babylon? Babylon don't love you. Babylon, Babylon doesn't love the church. Babylon hates the church. Rabashita Baba. Babylon hates the church. I don't care what dress they come in, what smell they come in. Babylon hates the church. If it were not for the Holy Spirit to stand in the way, you literally are about to see the true colors of people. They can sugarcoat you. They can say they like you. They can say they are on your side. But Babylon does not. It will never be. And God will never allow Babylon to be united with the body of Christ. No. he never do that. He'll never do that. So we, we run to Babylon because we, we get our bread there. We, our financial system and survival is there. And we think that Babylon loves us. No, we are the people who have actually held back. Because of the church, we are the people that have held back some of Babylon's true colors. And now you're seeing the true colors of Babylon are coming out. When you hear what the Pope is talking about, when you hear what everybody's talking about, you begin to understand they're coming. They're improvising many ways to make sure that the church can be shut down. And the only person that can rescue us from all of that mess is Jesus Christ. That's why he came for us. He came to us. Because Babylon don't want the true Christians of God to arise. And the reason why you ought to be a love of God now, it is this onslaught, it's this persecution, it is this very bitter, you know, dark, dark forces that want to take away the dark fabric of our faith in our day to day. They hate one thing because they know we have a true living God. We do. Michael, what are you talking about? I'm talking about your bond with God 
that cannot be separated by no man, nobody, because if you believe that, that Christmas means to you, well, this, this day, I'm not going to debate times and tw December 25th and when and where. I'm not going to go into all of that. But what I'm going to say, if you're celebrating the birth of Jesus and it means all that to you, it means an expression of love that's been poured to you. And if that means all that to you, all you got to see is that Jesus poured out. God poured out his love toward you that he might pick you out of Babylon, set you apart, and then send you back to bring many unto him. That's what it is. So Jesus goes, going back to my text about unbind the friend of Jesus and let him go. He gets over there and Martha is so paranoid. Martha said, I wish you were here, Master. I wish you were here. Again, look at that. Jesus goes to Lazarus. Lazarus is completely decomposing, completely broken completely dead, not breathing, he's gone. What makes a man come to your rescue at your worst, not at your best? There are those who will be with you at your best. But what makes someone come for you at your worst and they still believe in you? They still care for you. They still know. I remember that in verse 10, and verse 40 of verse 38, you know, Jesus was almost, in this text, the entire text was kicked out. And they wanted to grab a hold of him and arrest him. In, in, in John chapter 10 and verse 38, if you read that. And the Bible says he escaped out of them. There was great resistance. And then he went to the Jordan. When he get, got to the Jordan, he stayed there for three days. And that's why the report about his friend about Lazarus meets him there. But what I want to read over there, you know, while he stayed there, there were people who were there. They looked at him and said, this man is truly a man of God. The Bible said they believed in him before he had been rejected. And the point I'm trying to make over there is that some people will reject you at your worst. Some people will reject you at your worst. Because you don't have this, you don't line up, you don't fit in, and all of those boxes and the isms they try to put, up, put around you. You don't fit their narrative, so therefore they will not try to be around you. But that's not what Jesus does, and I showed you that yesterday. He, wa he wants to walk in. I don't know what situation you're going through right now, my friends. I don't know. But he wants to walk in right now. Maybe you're a pastor, you're watching me, and you don't know what to do. Like Lazarus, everything is at a dead end. Like Lazarus, you have been wrapped up in, 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 in a funeral clothing. You're done, you're gone, they wrap you up. Your ministry is so wrapped up, it cannot open up. Your life is so tangled up, it's, it's, you're so locked up, nothing can seem to work. Like Lazarus, it looks like things are dead. No hope. I don't know who I'm talking to. I understand hopeless can be a death. Stress and bitterness. You know, feeling that you're all alone and the doors are closed to you. It can be anything that causes you to be stuck and raises the impulse of your fears. The fears of your past and your present. Is a danger to you now. Who am I talking to today? That's a stuck right there. And, and you can tell that by the passion of Mary and Martha. Their passion is to see their brother awake. They loved him. So did Jesus. So what's amazing about the story is that three people love this dead man. If you can have three people who love you, Three people who are so passionate about you, not at your best, even when you're down, when you're crying, when you're in need. If you can have three disciples, Jesus had three. He had John. Who else? Who are the three? Especially John was so close to Jesus. But if you can have three of these, 
all right you are so blessed not when you are good when everything is going all right the people and you you walk a journey with them and you go through trials and tribulations with them and they're still there you go through trials and tribulations with them and they're still there they say we're sticking with you we're standing with you if you can have three you're blessed because that's what's important for you to have so three people are in the life of Lazarus Lazarus is completely dead and wrapped up very tight the Jewish people wrapped you up and the kind of clothes they tied you in they tie you because they want to make sure the stench doesn't come out of your body so that the, the kind of clothing they wore, wore you they they dry your bones you dry with them they were very strong and they're thrown in, into the tomb and Jesus is still saying it's not dead yet the situation is not dead yet you see death he sees life. You see defeat. He sees, de he sees victory. He see, you see disappointment. He sees hope. And here's a problem that happens to saints. Is that every time your narrative is predicated on every negative force that comes through your mind, you will always produce what you conceive. Can I repeat that again? Any time your mind is willing to bend over to what's negative to what's dying to what was used to be you will produce the results of that very past you, you forgot or you walked away from you will produce that that event you will relive it right now you cannot create the greatest miracle of your future trying to bring a backdrop of what used to be you cannot you cannot never you rather you rather depend on the miracle of your future and the miracle of your future keeps calling you to go forward you cannot try to recreate a miracle of your future trying to recreate a backdrop you want to you want that the picture of your future to look like the one that used to be it don't work that way it don't work that way yes i'm not trying to cancel everything that happened to you you know, I'm not trying to say it's not legitimate. Yeah, there was pain, there was disappointment, there was all those kind of things. But there's a time when Jesus comes into that situation and he wants you to live again. He wants you to hope again. He wants you to trust again. He wants you to pray again. He wants you to be free and be healed out of your wounds, out of your fears. Jesus wants you to wake up. And if you believe that in the month of December, is the month that you're trying to celebrate the birth and the resurrection of Jesus. If you believe that, and that's what it means to you, and you're going to go buy gifts for people and your friends and family and everybody, you know, if you really believe, then you must let Jesus affect you with his unconditional love. Let him affect you with it. Allow him to come to the darkest parts of your inner man and I let him come in tell him Lord I cannot get rid of this I cannot overcome my fears and my past my anxieties and everything Lord I give all to you just like you gave him your life give him all child of God give it up give up something give up something today child of God it's time for you as a child of God it's, it's, it's time for you to say, Lord, come into the very crevices, the places in me that I don't trust with nobody. The conversations and the thoughts I don't trust with nobody. I give them to you. Take control of them. Take them, Lord. Free me from trying to be anything that I'm not. You can do that. Because... There is no way you can fall in love with somebody that you would never express your true self to. You cannot do that. Then, then that relationship will be fake. That's why Jesus, you know, he walks right into all of that. You try to explain to him, I'm not perfect. He says, I don't care. I did this last year. He says, I don't care. I'm so broken. I'm this. You try to explain anything. Try to tell Jesus anything about you. He will still love you unconditionally. 
Now, that's not a message <laughs> some religious people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear it. Those who think are too perfect for God hate to hear the message of grace. They hate it. They will be angry because they feel like you've got to go through their process and what they've tried to done, they've tried to do, you know, to impress God. And yet God just comes in. Well, they can try to do whatever they want to do. If they want to do it the old way, they then do it the old way. But you are loved by God. That Lazarus, Jesus has gone right close to the tomb. And he's going to tell them something very profound. And the Lord spoke to me about this. For the most part, the picture of the death of Lazarus is the picture of the church. The body of Christ. And I know pastors are watching me here tonight. Listen to me. It's a picture of the church that's being dead. That's, that's in the verge of being dead. Just like the churches, the seven churches in Revelation. They're going through processes of, you know, to the point of death. And he's warning them and he's telling them, hey, hold fast to what you still have left. Revelation 3. Okay. You're not really dead. You're not completely. You've not, you haven't run out of life completely. He's telling the church, one of the churches in uh, Revelation 3, to literally get up. He says, I know your works. Okay? The church of Jesus Christ right now is in a dilemma. And I told you that yesterday. It needs to be resurrected again. It needs to be revived again. It needs to be resuscitated again. The pandemic has hit it. And it's left the church with nothing to, do, to, to, to linger and, stab it and and stand on. The church of Jesus Christ. The Lord told me, tell my people. Okay? And the picture of Lazarus him being wrapped in these clothing and tied and dead is a picture of the church that the world system has wanted to bury the church. They want to bury the church. They want to bury the church. They want to see the church, the body of Christ shattered. They want to bring in humanism, atheism, all of the isms. They want to bring them the new ages. And they want to even see satanic people come onto the streets rather and not Christians. And yet for the most part, we have been the force that has stood for righteousness. Saints, it's a wake-up call. And now we're asking God, please, Lord, help us. Where are we? Where is the church? Every pastor is going through so many questions. Every pastor. Because it looks like we've been wrapped up and tied so neat. And when you're, when you're separated from your friend and you're wrapped up and thrown into the tomb, thrown away, thrown away, when you are tied, pastors, who are watching me, this is a word of encouragement to you. The feeling that you're separated and everything is tight and tied. There's no way, there's no freedom, there's no liberty. You want to do more for God, but you're limited. Leaders, my friends, pastors, saints. Maybe you're tied emotionally, spiritually. There's no life. And like Lazarus, something good is about to happen. Because as long as Jesus is close to the point, is close to the very thing, the very situation that, 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 that looks absurd, something good is about to happen. Because as he gets to the tomb, you know, one of the key words there, he told him, okay? I want to read it to you. He said to them, Where have you laid him? They say to him, Lord, come and see. The first question is asking them, Where have you laid him? And I like because Jesus is going to ask very specific questions. Question number one Where did you dump him? Where did you dump him? Where did you dump my friend? Why did you dump my friend? Look at the first question is, where did you dump my friend? He wants to make sure they know. Because if they're the ones that orchestrated the dumping, they have to make sure they show him where they dumped him. 
So in other words, he's asking them. So now you didn't see that picture there. How many people have dumped you? How many people have thrown you, thrown you under the bus? How many people have done that to you and it devastated? Some of you would never, some of you have even promised you would never love again. You would never fall in love again because, because you were dumped. You are you're spiritually, everything devastated you. You know, your ministry is in a situation like that. But I come with the word of God today to let you know the master is looking for you. He says, where are you? He doesn't care about the situation. He says, where? If he can find you at your location, if he can find you at your zip code, whatever, it doesn't matter how it looks like. Some good is about to happen. I feel the anointing already. If he can find you at your zip code, if you can be located, if you can be located, you can be revived. If you can be located, you can be revived. If Jesus can locate you, he will revive you. He will resuscitate you. He will awaken you. If Jesus can find you in this holiday, in this season, while everything is going on, while the pandemic is going on, he's going to give you a brand new life. If he can find you, if he can locate you, he can revive you. And that's the first question. And they told him, Master, okay, come see. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. Immediately they had the word, where did you dump him? The Jews said, look how he loved him. Because it's love that goes beyond pain, that goes beyond imperfection. It's love that goes beyond all of the filth and the death. And he tries to go deeper to cleanse the wounded. Go through the wounds and try to clean them up and make you brand new. He said, see how he loved him. In other words, somebody else would have just walked away. Michael, what are you, what are you trying to talk about? I'm talking about love. That's what love does. I told you, the people that move you, they're the people you will reach. They're the people you will serve. You know? And he says to some of them, he said, could not this man who opened his eyes of the blind, now they're trying to test him. They're trying to talk about that. And then he came close to them. The part that I want to say to you is number two, he commanded them. Number two, he commands them and said, take away the stone. He did not say, please. He didn't say, please. He said, take away the stone. Well, Mike, I've had that message before. You know, we preached about it. Yeah, it's the most common preached about. This text is the most preached about text. But like in context to love, in context to love, the heart is the most sensitive part of you the heart and when the heart is wounded and the more it's wounded it turns from from a place of vulnerability to a place where it's done sick and tired and sick and tired angry it becomes a heart of stone Nothing gets through. Nothing comes out. When it's filled with anger, when it's filled with bitterness and unforgiveness and regret and shame, the hurt becomes the heart of stone. Jesus is standing there and they say, you try to put a stone on that man to hinder him to come out. Now I ask you to take it away. He didn't, he didn't come there. They were, Oh, the verse before they try to tell him why could he be the one do that Jesus said no you conditioned him that way you imposed your will on him you wrapped him up and I hear the Lord say to me to tell you that's what the enemy has been trying to do to you to your life he's been trying to do it to your heart 
But I hear the Lord command him right now. Get out of the way, devil. Stick out of the way. Get out of the way. Because something good is about to happen in the child of God's life. He said, remove the stone. It's the heart, the stone of your woundedness, the stone of your regrets, the stone of your shame, the stone where you're disgusted about the church and some of its people. A stone that hurts self. So Michael, what do I do with that? Do I just walk foolishly? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying that when you try to lock your heart away from people, you actually kept Jesus out too. And the hardest part is for you to say, I have been literally wounded by Jesus' people first. It makes you rethink and question your walk with God. And if you can, if the stone can be removed, your healing will come. If the stone can be removed, your transformation will come. If the stone can be removed, your relationship with God will be so impactful, will be mighty. The stone. Today, our churches are full of people who are hanging on to hardy stones, the heart of stone. No matter how many sermons we preach, some people cannot nudge, cannot change. They say, no, pastor, I am hurt. I am hurt. I cannot forgive them, pastor. I cannot. I would never do that. My family members did this to me. I would never. And they're, they're so tight. They're so uptight with everything, every pain. Our churches are packed with people who just come in to have a two, two hours, a high or two hours. They rather say, Lord, I love you. But inside, it's a heart of stone. And no matter what someone will preach, they've refused to let go. The greatest revival that can affect the human race is the revival that transforms and transforms our hearts. I could have, I could have held on to so much heart, to so much betrayal, to so much pain that people have caused me. But I found out I was going to miss out on the love of God. You know, and I remember years back when I was a teenager, I had an issue of bitterness. I gotta say that to you. I, I became bitter because of something. And, and you know what? It was it was getting bad. I was I was feeling like my heart was becoming. It was a heart of stone. I felt that vengeance would be better for me to get my way. You know, tit for tat. You hurt me. Likewise, you're gonna get get it back seven times more. <laughs> and then, but at the same time, I had I, I loved God so much. So one day, I'm pretending to be funny. I'm standing on the pulpit and preaching and everything. And the Lord says to me, Michael, I will not use you until you let go of your bitterness. You will never see another dimension of your anointing until you let go of that which you hold into into your heart. Can you know some people? Literally, I was serving God with all my passion because I had an underlying issue of pain. Pain was driving me to do something perfect for God. And yet God said, no, you cannot come to me with your imperfect poison. You're toxic. You let the toxins of other people get to you. And now you're coming to me trying to serve me. Listen to that. I would not trust nobody. And God, I pray, I remember so well, I had to apologize, I had to, I had to repent before God. Because the more I loved God, the more I fell in love with God, I felt like I could not have served two masters. I could not serve the pain and still serve God. I let it go. And when I let it go, you know, my life became brand new. All of a sudden, different dimensions of my ministry started taking off. All right? I cannot stand on the pulpit and preach like a beat-up preacher. I don't stand on the pulpit to beat people up. 
I don't stand on the pulpit to just call people's names and all of that and be angry. No, I don't do that. Why? Christ died for them. Christ died for them. Saints, I came to remind you today, you want to be affected by God? You want to be affected by the love of God? Let go of some of the things. The heart of stone, okay? Let's get this heart of stone right now. Let's get whatever we put into the heart of stone, whatever we put, we try to put in. We put in regrets, we put in um, pain, we put in the past, we put in family members, we put in everything and we're wrapping it up right inside of us, okay? Whatever we try to do to put it in, okay? We're gonna just get a hold of it and put it into the hands of Jesus and ask the life of Jesus to come inside of us. It doesn't make you feel weak. It doesn't make you feel nothing. It actually makes you stronger. It makes you healthy. It makes you happy. All of a sudden, when people see you still going for God and say, they wonder, they thought they put, they dumped you, but no. Jesus picked you up. And that's why he's telling the guys, take away the stone. Take it away. Tonight, that's what the Lord's saying to you. Take away the stone. They, when they remove the stone, they roll the stone away. All right? Guess what Jesus said? Jesus shouted and called the name of his friend. He called Lazarus. And he said to him, come forth. Lazarus. Imagine he's come for you at your worst moment in your life and say, come forth. Come on, church, come on. Everything that has tied you, like he showed me, everything that's been trying to wrap and hinder you, he said, come out, walk out. Walk back into your destiny. Walk back into the fullness of God. That's what he's saying to us. He's saying to the church, get out, come out, come out. And I know you're going to say, but you know, I don't feel like, yeah, he said, come out. Because at the command of Jesus, everything and every chain and every shackle that try to hold you has to be broken. And this is the season before you cross over 20 to 2021, the shackles are breaking. Everything that's been trying to come against you, the warfare that's been coming against your relationship with God, those shackles, broken it's broken and the lord god is untying the wrapping that's been all around you that's been around your ministry the hindrance the rejection the forces of the enemy that are really held you thinking that nothing is going to change he's breaking it away because the stone the heart of stone has been rolled away now it's time for breakthrough Amen. Amen. And guess what happened? Lazarus came out. I don't know how he did it. Because you can be that you can be that wrapped. Like he was wrapped. And you walk out. Unless the power, the power of God got a hold of him. And he, he began to get out. He began to walk out of the tomb. And Jesus looks at his friend. He looks at his friend. He said, you remove the stone between me and my friend. Now there is no more stone in between us. There's no more hindrance. There's no, our bond is coming back again. The life is coming back again. Revival is coming back again. Hope is coming back again. Breakthroughs are coming back again. Whatever was trying to come in between you and I has been removed. The hindrance, everything that's been trying to come between you and your God. Saints, it's time. It is time to unbind the friend of Jesus and let him go. It's time. That's you. He's saying to every demonic forces in the atmosphere, unbind my friends, unbind the church. 
He's telling the church. He's telling the, your enemies. They have no access. They have no power. Not anymore. Whatever he's been trying to do. Time is up. Unbind my friends and let them go. He tells them as he gets out. And the reason why he has to tell them that. To unbind him. Another translation says loose him. Okay. Loose him. It's time for the church to go loose. It's time for the body of Christ to go loose. It's time for the men and women of God and the saints of God who are hearing me at the side of my verse to be loose from the yoke of death. We've been looking from, Jan from February to now. We've been wrapped around the pandemic, the death and the fear and the despair and everything that's going on. And the enemy has us to believe that it will never change. But the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to you and is saying to the body of Christ, it's time for you to be loose in Jesus' mighty name. Loose from fear. Loose from the yokes of the enemy. Loose from the pandemic. Loose from the, fat the, the, the fatigue. Loose. Loose everything that's been holding your ministry. Loose your family. Loose. The reason why he has to command them, you have to remember the Jewish culture. When they wrap you up, you're gone. He said, I didn't do that. Don't tell me to do what I never do. You are the one that imposed all of this on him so you can put him away. Now I command you to lose. The God is commanding the enemy that's been holding you back, standing in the way, Try to put a stone in between you and him. Try to put every kind of hindrance and warfare against your health, against your life and everything like that. It's time for everything to be loose. Loose! Unbind my friend and let him go. It's what I came to share with you, saints. It's what the Lord sent me to tell you. He told me, tell my church that we've been through the pandemic the wrapping and we're watching the 300,000 people going through and the fear everywhere and everything we're trying to do. But there is coming a mighty wind that's going to loose the body of Christ into the greatest mighty wave of the anointing we've never seen before. Those who have been weak are going to be strong. Those who have been in fear and despair and the loss and everything like that are awakened to the truth in the name of Jesus because our friend Jesus is coming with power and grace. Yes, it is your word. He sent me here to tell you that. And by my friend, you have no power to hinder me to be to live a life with a deep conviction and the love of God. Child of God, the Lord sent me here to tell you, you're going to get back what the enemy has been trying to steal away. Because, because guess what happens? You know what Lazarus tells Jesus? Because I'm going to wrap this thing up. You know what Lazarus tells Jesus? After he rose from the dead, he said, let's go home. I want to go to my house. He said, why would Lazarus tell Jesus, let's go to my house? Well, because it's not enough for you to be called out from the tomb. Because you remember when his funeral, everybody's crying. While they are crying your death and your loss, they are also taking your stuff away. They're sharing your chairs. They're sharing your, your inheritance. They're sh I mean, they're sharing your, your, your savings and everything. They're taking everything away. While they're taking you away, they're taking everything away. So Lazarus was very smart. He said, please don't take me out of the tomb if we cannot go back home because I need to recover everything these people who put me in this condition put me in. <laughs> and so he took him. And the Bible says that while he's on his way, the Pharisees, the religious people, see the spirit of death again from the religious people comes in and because people were so excited, they said they, they scared to kill Lazarus. They scared Lazarus again. They scared Lazarus and Jesus. Look at that. When he brought you back from the condition 
that held you back. Guess what, saints? You will recover everything the enemy tried to steal from you. In 2020, the enemy has been made seen with you. It's time for recovery. It's time for recovery. It's time for you to lose the fear of man and walk into the fullness of God. You will never be afraid of nobody but God because you're recovering it all. The Lord sent me to tell somebody at the sound of my voice, whatever you've been through, church, whatever you've been through, this wrapping, this element of death and the death angel that's been going house to house all over the world is being defeated by God so that the church can arise again, the church can be revived again so that a mighty move of God is going to break out in the name of Jesus. Are you ready? Are you ready? I pray that you're ready because it's time. Unbind the friend of Jesus and let him go. That's what I pray for you. Tonight, the Lord sent me here. I'm coming back tomorrow with some more. I say from now going forward will be that. Hopefully you've been blessed. I look forward to seeing you again. God bless you and I'll see you tomorrow.